context of this lesson is important because uh, I want us to understand that all that what, who Peter's first audience was. Remember, we're talking about people in the first century, and we are talking about uh, the the way that life is lived as an alien and a stranger in uh, this culture uh, in in the first century. And what Peter has been doing, starting in verse, uh, well, actually, verse 11 of chapter 2, is a section that we've taken apart in our lesson, but it basically is, is folded all together in how to live in specific areas of interaction, of social interaction in their day that is also then very applicable to our day. So he talked about, first of all, how to, how to deal with society, with civil matters, with, with uh, how we respond to governmental authority. He spoke about the workplace when he spoke about slaves and their masters. And now he's speaking about the family. And of course the family, the operative word, not only in uh, these, the first two about the government and also about the workplace, but now in this section, the operative concept is a word that we often shy away from. In fact, somebody in the group I was uh, talking with this morning said, uh, back in the day, uh, in, in our younger day especially, uh, when women's lib was just coming into full flower, or um, dandelion flower, I guess you might say, <laughs> in many ways, the operative word was called the S word, because you could not ever think about being submissive. Uh, it, was, it was a very it was a very demeaning word for wives. Peter does not use that term for either civil obedience or <coughs> workplace standards of conduct or within the family uh, as a bad word. In fact, it is a good word. It's a God word in that regard. Uh, he's speaking to people who uh, are, are, their world is changing. The paradigm is changing. Uh, and we have the, the benefit of two millennia, actually, of uh, Christian principles being, especially in Western society, uh, of being, becoming more the norm. The family, for example, is, is much more uh, understood, I think, in biblical context today than it would have been in the first century. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, in the first uh, division of my talk. Uh, but I think we, we come into... Uh, the, uh, the talk about well, how the family is supposed to work, even within my lifetime, and my, I've been married for 55 years now, um, even within the time of my marriage, I think there's been so much more within the Christian uh, community about how to live as a family than there was when I started out. I wish I'd known a lot uh, that you all, you younger gals, know about families uh, when I was starting to raise my children. I, I had three children within five years, and I was not a very good mom at that point. And God is good, and he's kind of reclaimed all my kids, <laughs> even despite my, my bad, um, bad, bad beginning with them. Uh, but submission is now the operative word and I think we need to understand it's a godly word with, reg with regard to how Peter is speaking about these three very essential areas of, of life uh, in, in this world, in the world in which we are aliens and strangers. First of all, I thought, and uh, I know some of you like to know what my outline of my talk is, and that's why I put this really very, uh, very simple outline on the board, because I think it's important that we think about marriage in the Roman world. That, that's the first thing. But then, of course, uh, the first uh, six verses talk to wives, uh, and they are Christian wives with un, uh, mostly unbelieving husbands is what we're talking, what his context is here. And then he's also going to be talking in that seventh verse uh, uh, to Christian husbands uh, in that particular context. So let's think just a bit about um, marriage in the Roman world. And I, I was hel helped, and I hope you were as well, by some of the, the um, notes that were given in our lesson to give us a picture of what it might have been like as these women uh, were hearing or reading what P Peter was saying with regard to, to marriage. First of all, women were considered, no matter how old they were, they were considered dependents. Uh, they were first a dependent of the, their own father, and then as they were married, they were dependent of, of their husband with no, really no civil or marital rights. 
Uh, the Jewish culture had elevated women uh, to a degree, but women in, even in the Jewish culture uh, the, from which Christianity sprang uh, were still considered uh, second-class citizens uh, in most respects. Now there are, even in the scripture, there are several uh, exceptions to that. Many of you may remember in Acts, I think it's 17, uh, where, where Paul goes um, to uh, Philippi and he, the first person he meets is Lydia, who is a, an entrepreneur. She's a businesswoman. She uh, actually lives in another city and she's traveled. She has a home uh, of her own and she is an independent woman. And so there were some independent women in the Roman culture, but by and large, the people that would be that uh, Peter would be talking to would be in in the mainstream of the culture of the Roman Empire, and that would be that women were very dependent on men. Uh, in many cases in the Roman world, uh, women, a, a husband, a man would have a wife to have children and to keep his home, uh, but he would also very blatantly and overtly have a mistress, perhaps even a young boy. Uh, that he would have relationship with. Uh, and so the woman had an entirely different uh, piece of family life than we would consider, that our minds would immediately trigger with regard to that. Now Christianity changed all of this, not instantaneously. And I was mentioning in, um, in our group this morning that uh, if you have been to other cultures, uh, for example, in Africa, uh, many women are still, uh, if, if, if they're not a part of the Christian culture, uh, if they're a part of the uh, national mores of Africa, they are still considered uh, totally identified with their husband. And if their husband dies, uh, they are left out in the cold. Even their children are, are taken by the husband's family. And so ministry to <coughs> widows in those cultures is very, very important because they are left without resources. Uh, but in Christian, in Christ, as Christianity spread throughout especially the Western world, uh, there was a change in, in the status of women. But what Peter is speaking to now is, is the very beginnings of that. Uh, what seems to be the situation here is that a great number of women were being responsive to the gospel, but the husband would remain a pagan. And so uh, this created some really touchy situations for the wife, and that's what we'll be, we'll be looking at as we look at the, at the scripture. When a husband would become a, a believer, uh, the culture would say that his entire family would follow him. And so a believing husband with an unbelieving wife had a different dynamic uh, in, in that relationship. I remember when um, the Philippian jailer uh, asked, how what shall I do to be saved? And Paul says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. Um, whether they all had an intimate relationship with Christ, we don't know, but at least that household, because of the head of the household, that the hu household became uh, involved in, in Christianity. So the hus having a believing husband and an unbelieving wife is not even referred to here uh, in, in this regard, uh, although we could look at verse 7 uh, as a way of husbands giving testimony uh, to the, the uh, reality of the, the uh, reality of Christ in their life. Uh, if a wife was converted and the husband uh, remained a pagan, uh, it created difficulties. You know, this is not the woman I married. Uh, and it's true, isn't it? Some of you have had that experience where you have become a believer uh, and your husband has not. Uh, and there, there is there's just a difference, isn't there, in, in the relationship. And so this is a, a real situation in many lives even today. Um, the apostles taught that in Christ, the distinction between male and female had disappeared. Galatians 3 is the text uh, that we look at with regard to that. Galatians 3, uh, verses 26 and to 28, he says, you are all, Now you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so the relationship within the body of Christ is one of equality. What does he say? What does Peter say? Your co-heirs 
of the gospel of life, if indeed uh, you are both believers with regard to that. Um, but that does not negate the equality of believers in God's sight, does not negate what God established at, at creation, and that is roles in the family. Uh, and both in creation and the creation of Eve, as well as in uh, the results of the fall, it's clear that God has set up, uh, to make things work, a hierarchical structure within the family. And so the, the husband has the leadership role. That's the God-ordained way of doing it. So. The wife then does not have a less important role, but it's just like in the military, you, you have a commander who, ha who has the responsibility, but then you have the regular guys who uh, are no less intelligent, maybe even more intelligent, they're, they're, they're no less gifted, but they are, they are submitting to the leadership of the commander. It's the same kind of thing that God has ordained in the family. Why? God knows how we... <laughs> how we're wired, doesn't he? He knows that we need to have a structural authority of roles. So we're talking now about a very a complicated situation in that day. Uh, and so Peter's writings are really very helpful. Now Paul also speaks when he, uh, in chapter 5 of Ephesians, he speaks to the husband and wife relationship. And actually he has more instruction for the husbands uh, than he does for the wives. Uh, but Peter here now seems to be focusing more on the dilemma of a believing wife with a non-Christian husband. And that's why he spends more space uh, talking to the wives. Uh, and it's, and uh, so we, we put all of Scripture together to formulate the concept that God has in mind. Christian wives have become the citizens of the kingdom of God. And so how do they live in this situation? Uh, he does lay out, as I've said before, some valuable principles even for those who are not dealing with non-Christian husbands or for, if you're not dealing with a husband at all. Uh, because as I say, I think that we have some characteristics of femininity that are really helpful for us here. So what does he say to Christian wives? Well, that's verses 1 through 6. In the same way, he says, wives, be submissive to your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. So uh, it's one, we are thinking about in the same way. I'm not sure where your brain went when you answered that question, but my brain went back to chapter 2, verse 13, where it says, um, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority. This is the concept that we're dealing here as Peter is talking about submission. Remember, this is what uh, in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2, he says, you're going to live as aliens and strangers. And as people watch you, they are going to, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, as they watch you, they're going to have to eventually glorify God because you're living the kind of life that brings glory to God. And so in the same way now, living your life, uh, before the face of God, is, as um, people might say, this is the way now that you're able to sort out the pressures and the tensions that come, wives, as in the situation you are now living in. Um, William Barclay says, um, the first thing to notice in this is what Peter does not tell them to do. He doesn't tell them to leave their husband. And in fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 talks about the fact that if a believing wife uh, has an unbelieving husband, but that unbelieving husband is willing to, to keep the marriage intact, that the believing wife should stay in that marriage. And it says because, uh, kind of a, a difficult phrase, the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, which, which basically means the blessing of having a believer in the home spills out into uh, the life of the husband. So first of all, he doesn't tell her to leave. Secondly, and this is hard, he doesn't tell her to preach or to nag or to harangue your husband. 
with regard to that. Um, one of my friends a number of years ago was so concerned about her unbelieving husband. And when he would travel, she'd put scripture verse in his socks. Um, <laughs> and it actually didn't work until much later on when he finally uh, submitted to the Lord. Uh, but, you know, you, you, uh, if you are concerned about anybody who's lost, but especially if it's a wife who's concerned about a husband who is lost, uh, you want to do everything, don't you? But well, Peter is not saying that, is he? He's not saying to preach or to nag or to argue with them. And he's also telling her, as Barclay points out, not to insist that in my faith we have different rules uh, because that's not the way that the Roman culture was, uh, was working uh, in that regard, you, you can't, the believing wife is not told to change the rules of the relationship. She is supposed to work within that relationship. So he doesn't tell her to do some things, but he does tell her, Peter does, to do some things, to be a good wife. And how does he define that? Well, first of all, in verses 1 and 2, he says to be submissive. Now, remember we're talking about voluntary selflessness, not out of fear, but out of love. And notice he is saying to your own husbands. He's not saying this, that this relationship that you need to, uh, in un, unfamily-like ways, submit to other women's husbands or to other men. That's another, that's another thing. But this is the function that God has designed. You're not a lesser person, but you have a specific role. And so in, your, in the life of you and your own husband, uh, this is what you're to do. You're to be submissive. And how, how is that valuable? Well, as the fragrance of your life then extends to your husband, he says, um, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. Uh, interesting, and I don't know if any of you have actual history uh, in your own life of seeing that happen. Uh, I know that some of us who have started out with believing husbands have seen in, as we have grown in our walk with the Lord, we have seen that that growth in the walk with the Lord has kind of uh, moved our husbands much more toward being the spiritual leader in our home and wanting to grow. I can certainly attest to that in my own relationship uh, in that God has done some really, really neat things with my husband uh, in, in that regard. Uh, and so even being won over without words to be more passionate about the Lord, to be, to be uh, more uh, dedicated to him, I think is, is one of the uh, kind of tangential uh, results of, of regard to this. And he says that this will be when they see your purity and the reverence of your lives. You remember now, uh, you're not supposed to worship your husband. You're supposed to worship God and have reverence for him. But there is an, an aspect of reverence, is there not, uh, that, can, that has honor, uh, that has respect. In fact, that's the word uh, in Paul's writing in, verse, in chapter 5 of Ephesians that he uses, respect, honor, or respect your husband. He says, when, when they see the purity of your life, even though that may be a big change for them, uh, and if they see the reverence that you have toward God that then bleeds over into your respect and honor for the, your husband, uh, that, that will be a, a catalyst for God to work in their lives. You and I will never save our husbands, nor any of our kids or anything like that. God does that. But you and I can be the kind of women that draw people, not to ourselves, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. Your attitude toward God makes your character and you, the way you live your life an attractive trait in your life. And so he says, uh, first of all, to be a good wife, you be submissive. Uh, now what it takes to be a submissive wife to an unbelieving husband, uh, there's no one size fits all. Husbands make different requirements of wives. Some husbands say, don't ever go to church again. Uh, that's hard, and that you have to work that out. Uh, some husbands are physically abusive. Uh, and in that case, I think the, the words that we read last week with regard to the slaves uh, about uh, when we had that exercise, it was so hard about uh, looking up what other 
principles in scripture, is it ever right uh, to, to stay in an abusive situation when your life is in danger? Uh, there were several instances we read about in scripture last week that said, no, it's not, it's okay. In fact, it's right to not put yourself or your children in, at danger, in danger. So every one of these situations of husband, uh, a believing, an unbelieving husband and a believing wife really is a case in itself and it takes prayer, it takes wise counsel, uh, it takes keeping in mind what will most glorify God uh, to, to make a decision with regard to that. Uh, but the overall principle that he is saying now is to, uh, as you are concerned about the spiritual uh, situation of your husband is to first of all be submissive. Voluntary selflessness. Uh, and so this is the first thing he says. But then in the second thing, verses 3 and 4, uh, he says, be a good wife, keep the main thing the main thing. That's what I, my, my translation of this. Let's read what the scripture says. Your beauty should not come from outward adornments such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. That's a, an astounding phrase, is it not? The unfading beauty. And um, for those of us whose uh, body is fading. Uh, it, it's helpful to think about unfading beauty, is it not? Um, dress, jewelry, make no contribution to your and my spiritual growth. Um, yes, we want to be sure that we look good. We want to be sure that we don't, uh, th that we make, make ourselves attractive. But that's not to be the be-all and end-all of our life. Uh, William Barclay, in his in, um, commentary on this, does have an interesting comment about what, what the Roman wife's life would be like if she were not a believer. Listen to this. He says, why should men grudge women their ornaments and their dress? This is a Roman writer uh, speaking. Women cannot hold public offices or priesthoods or gain triumphs. They have no public occupations. What then can they do but devote their time to adornment and to dress? That's what the Roman uh, people thought about that. Um, and so William Barclay says, undue interest in self-adornment was then and still is nothing other than a sign that the person who indulges in it has no greater and wider things to occupy the mind. There. There you go with regard to that. Now, this text has been misunderstood by many people. Uh, is Peter telling us here that we are not to wear jewelry, not to wear makeup, not to, not to be concerned about clothes? Uh, no, that is not the case. But what he's saying is keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is your growth in character as you cultivate, what is it he says, a gentle and quiet spirit. Uh, as I thought about that, I thought about here's a, um, a person who is, a woman who is so much at peace with herself and God that she is able to have an equilibrium in dealing with the outside forces in her life so much at peace with God and with herself that she's able to handle those uh, situations in life with gentleness and with a quiet spirit. Um, somebody has said that this kind of a thing, she puts up with the demands of others while not making demands herself. And I think that is a good way of speaking about a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, this is character. It's not a cookie color per cutter personality. You know, those of us who are type A's uh, don't have to just revert to a type D or something like that. But within the personality that God has given us, we can be at peace with God and with ourselves so that in the sight of God, we can develop the kind of feminine characteristic that God is pleased with. Uh, he's not saying that you can't wear jewelry, and he's not saying that you shouldn't work to be attractive, but he's saying that you shouldn't so concentrate on that that the outside is all you have. And don't you think about women who are endowed with great physical beauty and how often they 
are not able to develop the inner being because nobody looks past uh, who they are uh, with, with regard to their physical beauty. So uh, be a, how do you be a good wife? Well, you're submissive versus one and two, and then you're keeping the main thing about developing your relationship with God, you're keeping that the main thing. And then he gives an illustration. He says it can be done, verses 5 and 6, because there were Old Testament women who did this. Uh, this may have caused you a little bit of trouble here because uh, he uses as his example Sarah. He says, for uh, this gentle and quiet spirit, for this is the way the holy men, women of the past who put their hope in God, file that, put their hope in God, used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. Now, there are a number of incidents in Sarah's life. Ba basically, Abraham is the main character uh, of that section of Scripture. He, of course, is the father of all the faithful. He's a hero of the faith. He was the man that everybody saw as being uh, godly, right? And yet there were things in his relationship with Sarah that were not necessarily easy for her, were they not? Uh, he lied about his relationship with her twice, once when they went to Egypt and once when they were living in the local area but with another one of the local kind of rulers. He lied about that twice. Uh, he said that she was his sister and not his wife, and what happened to her? She got taken into a harem. Uh, that would, in my mind, engender some fear. Now, I, don't you think so? How am I going to get out of here? Uh, and the one with Abimelech was right after the angels had, uh, and God himself had said to her, you're going to have a baby, and it's going to be soon. Uh, and here she is now, taken into Abimelech's harem. Um, so, we don't know what went on in Sarah's mind. We do know that uh, way back uh, when Abraham and Sarah left their homeland and came uh, into, the, into the promised land, uh, he knew how beautiful she was. And so he told uh, this man, well, when, when we left our homeland, we agreed that she would say that she's my sister so that I wouldn't get killed so that she could you know, be the wife of one of you pagan people. Uh, and actually, she is my sister. She's my half-sister. She's the daughter of my father and not of my mother. So he's telling this half-truth, and she's agreeing to it. Obviously, she doesn't have a whole lot of options. Uh, but what, evidently what God saw, and this is really striking to me, what God saw in this woman who was forced to go into a situation that would never have been her choice, uh, and her husband was submitting to fear of these local people. Uh, evidently, what God saw was that um, she obeyed Abraham and called him her master. She did what is right, and she did not give way to fear. God saw that, and he is complimenting her for that. Um, in her culture, she didn't have a lot of choice, but God knew what was going on inside of her. And he knew, apparently from what Peter has this inspired insight, that she was trusting in God. It reminds me of, and I'm fixated by this uh, the phrase about our Lord that was back in chapter 2, verse um, 23. He, he made no threats, but instead he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. I see that. That's, in the Greek, that's a continuing, kept entrusting himself, kept entrusting himself. And I see that same kind of a principle active in the life of a woman like Sarah who keeps in trust. God, you know this, you know this. I'm here, but you know this. And so God commends her in Peter's writing uh, and saying, you and I also are her uh, lineal sisters here. Uh, as we uh, do what is right and do not give way to fear. While Peter's commands, comments are in context really to specific wives whose husbands are not believers, I think of the, the fact that the wife's role in submitting to her husband is really the premise that Paul uses 
when he's talking about husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, uh, this, this text here is not all that is said about husband-wife relationships. But it does lead us into the next part in, in verse 7, and that is what, what are believing husbands supposed to do? Um, believing, I think in the context here, this is a believing husband and a believing wife. Why do I say that? Because I see in here um, they, that... Um, heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. I see that as being a way of saying that you, husband, your wife, is co-equal to you in the sight of God. Remember what Paul says, there's no Jew nor Gentile, no male nor female. I think that's what leads me to say that the instruction here to a husband is a husband with a, with a believing wife. Now, Will this work for, for husbands with unbelieving wives? I think so, but let's see what it says here. First of all, husbands in the same way, notice that this is introduced the same way. Now, the husband is not supposed to submit to the wife, but what is he supposed to do? Uh, he's supposed to be considerate as you live with your wives. Um, and some of the translations say with understanding. Study her. Know what turns her on, what turns her off. What is, um, is it Gary Chapman talks about the five love languages. Learn, uh, husband, he says, learn what your wife's love language is. Uh, with understanding, uh, can be considerate to her. Uh, secondly, uh, treat them with respect as the weaker partner. Uh, and some of us women say, well, I don't know about if I'm weaker or not, but I do know that despite some of my intellectual strengths and my spiritual strengths, um, my husband is a lot physically stronger than I am. He's the one who has to open the jars, right? Um, that kind of thing. The way God made the male phys uh, physique is stronger physically in most cases than the way that God made the female physique. And I think that Peter is speaking about the fact uh, that you're, you have been given the care of this woman who is not nearly as strong or as able to, to cope uh, in the physical area of life. And as I mentioned, in, in many cases, especially in this particular culture, these women had no rights. Uh, they were really the weaker uh, person uh, in the way that society worked. So physically weaker and perhaps uh, culturally weaker in that regard. And then he says, you are heirs together of the gracious gift of life. life. Uh, you are, um, with respect to spiritual understanding, he says, now husbands remember this, you are of equal standing with God. What is the old adage says, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Uh, and, and so husbands and wives understand that. The husband understands he has obtained grace and mercy from God. The wife understands she has obtained grace and mercy from God. And that brings them together in a mutuality that is not found in people who don't have that relationship with the Lord. And then Peter, at the end of this verse, says, God thinks this is really serious because, he says, uh, if you violate in these three principles about being considerate and respecting them as a weaker partner and a co-heir of the gift of life, something may hinder your prayers. They, uh, and scripture is clear that a horizontal relationship that has gone south really impedes the vertical relationship with God. What is, what is uh, Matthew say that the Lord said, if you know somebody has something against you, go to that person and make it right so that then you can come and offer your gift and, and God will accept it. So a principle that is not new even in Peter's day, um, but one that is very important and that God thinks for husbands that living with your wife as a co-heir of the kingdom of God is, is very, very important. Now, does all this sound Countercultural, even today, in many cases, yes, not nearly as catastrophic 
as in the first century, but very definitely giving us some counter-cultural principles of living. Peter was addressing these aliens and strangers in the first century, but through the inspiration of Scripture and through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine, we can understand that he's also speaking to you and to me. Uh, Counter-cultural, yes. Counter against what I really want. Do I really want to be submissive all the time? The thing I blew on Friday? It was so little. It was really, really dumb, but <coughs> by, I really wanted to have my way with regard to that. And God took me by the scruff of the neck with the scripture, and he, he can do that for you as well, ladies, can he? Because this is, this is the way to live in a, the kingdom of God as an alien and a stranger, giving glory to God uh, and having success in these particular areas of life. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you speak to us through your word. Lord, I realize that in this group of ladies, um, we, have, we run the gamut of people uh, who have had uh, the varying experiences available to women in this day and age. And I thank you for that. I thank you that your word uh, is applicable to each one of us, where we are, who we are, and how you see us. And so I pray that this morning will have been one of profit in your kingdom through your word for each one of us. I thank you for the way that you enrich us through the comments of others. And I thank you for the way that uh, you have uh, been gracious and merciful to us and not giving us what we deserve uh, as we struggle against um, our desires to not be submissive. But I thank you that you have given us what we need for life and for godliness and for living this life. And so we go out of here uh, with grace and with mercy and with peace. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.